Nestled within the heart of Africa lies the awe-inspiring Barotsa floodplain. A part of the world that is still largely untouched, with nature stretching as far as the eye can see. This beautiful ecosystem lies in the western province of Zambia, locally known as Barotsaland. and is the lifeblood of the Lozi people whose past and future are deeply connected with the waters that flow through this breathtaking landscape. My name is Luc Rosenau, a filmmaker and researcher specialized in fisheries management. Drawn to the beautiful nature and unique fishery of the Barotsa floodplain, I embarked on a journey to understand how we can ensure a more sustainable future for this fishery. My journey takes us through the lives and experiences of diverse stakeholders that have shaped how they look at the world. Their different ways of looking at the world has the potential to explain success or failure on the path towards a more sustainable fishery. For success, it may be required that social learning takes place. This means learning to manage the fishery together, which could lead to a change in the way that stakeholders look at their world, and collective action to manage the fishery more sustainable. For this reason, I want to understand how the different stakeholders look at the fishing and governance practices and how this affects social learning. This in hope that the insights this journey unveils might provide some ideas on how to realize a more sustainable Barotsa floodplain fishery. The first day in the western province of Zambia, locally known as Barotsaland. I was welcomed very nicely by my landlady Luongwe Mulopo. She took me to see the floodplain for the first time. Its vastness, the birds and the dugout canoes filled me with excitement. What do we have there? It's very clear that Luongwe is a Lozi. And it's also very clear that I am not. My fall represented the difference in upbringing and culture. It showed me that I entered a different world and I was very curious to learn more. I arranged a meeting with Maswabi Lishandu or Induna Luyanga, which is an official role in the traditional leadership that is called the Barotsa Royal Establishment. He tells me about the history and culture of Barotsaland. This Baros as a country or a nation or a state is a full-fledged kingdom who is headed by the head of state who is the king and the litunga who is got the prime minister and his cabinet where we have all these uh, portfolios the administration of barosland touches squarely on its ethnic cultural tradition customs belief to learn more about the culture and beliefs of the Lozi people, I had a conversation with Victor Shachoka. He's in charge of the National Heritage Conservation Commission, or NHCC, and plays a high interest in the Barotsa floodplain as a cultural landscape. 
So according to the mythology, at some point God was living amongst the lost people here. But over time, because of people's mischief, God decided to go up in heaven. He left uh, a person who today we call the Litunga. Okay, the name Litunga itself means land. So it means the fish, the animals, the birds, the grass, the trees, and the people. So the Litunga is symbolic. He's more or less a date. He's more or less a god. Okay, that was given to the people to manage them and everything in this uh, ecosystem. Victor further tells me about different cultural norms related to fishing. Uh, the Litunga himself, for instance, when you save him fish, he doesn't eat the whole fish. He would just eat uh, one side of it. And that is symbolic of how fish is viewed. So that, in a sense, he is telling his people, that even as you are catching this fish, don't catch everything, okay? Just cut, catch part of it so that there is still fish for tomorrow and the years after. The Lozi people take great pride in their fish, culture, customs and beliefs. And to be honest, their life on the floodplain is without question extraordinary. Luongwe tells me about the dynamic lifestyle of the Lozi people in the floodplain. Yeah, like where my father comes from, his village is called uh, Namusa. And so during the floods, the people move from their plains, they go to the upper land, to their other village, which is still called Namusa. Yeah, and when the floods go down, they come back to the plains. Yeah. The annual migration that Luongwe is talking about is called the Komboka and is one of the largest cultural celebrations of Zambia. The literal translation of Komboka is to get out of water, where the Litunga and the traditional administration move from the royal village of Leelui in the floodplain towards the royal village of Limalunga in the upper land. The livelihoods of the Lozi people are also governed by the floods throughout the year. When the floods recede, it leaves fertile ground behind. So in the dry season, the Lozi people mostly depend on agriculture and their cattle that graze the floodplain. Hmm, how are you? I'm good. I meet up with Andrew who is a farmer. He has cattle as well and is proud to show Elephant his largest bull. Andrew also grows many different crops. Okra, cabbage, carrots, rice and many more. However, the most important crop is corn as the Lozi people eat it every day in the form of mohobe. To make it, they dry the corn, mill it and cook it with water to make a thick porridge. Their favorite relish to eat it with is fish. When the Zambezi river floods, the Lozi people shift their livelihoods from agriculture towards fishing. During the height of the flooding, the most commonly used method to catch fish are gill nets. These nets stand vertically in the water 
and traps fish behind their gills that try to swim through it. The size of the fish caught in the net depends on its mass size. Currently, the gill nets have a mass size of 1 to 3 inches. In high water, most fishers will also use traps made out of wood, which is called a mukuko. They will put some bait in the trap and the fish will swim inside, but will be unable to swim outside. The traps are dispersed throughout the floodplain. When the floods recede, the fish will concentrate in streams. The fishers will adjust their fishing methods to effectively catch the fish. By for example, using cast nets. Another method used with lower water are fishing weirs. The fishers build a large construction in the middle of a stream and leave a small opening for the fish to swim into. The owner tells me he is very concerned as he is catching a lot of crayfish. Because these are problems. Mm. Yes. The Lozi people call it the Chinese fish, as they believe the Chinese, who were contracted to build the bridge over the floodplain, released it in the water. The fisher told me to come back the next morning when he empties his net. I was shocked to see the amount of crayfish in the net after one day of fishing. The Chinese fish contributes to the poverty of the fishers as they eat the fish in the net, making them unfit for sale. As of now, there is no market for the Chinese fish as no one eats them, so they throw them away. Traditionally, in Lozi culture, the men are allowed to fish with the dugouts and nets. The women take care of the children and barely have access to the fishery. If they do fish, they are mostly confined to using lower class fishing methods, like fishing baskets. I'm having a meeting with David Limbua, the program coordinator of an NGO called the Young Women Christian Association, or YWCA. He tells me about the role of the women in the fishery. One aspect we have realized is that the women are not privileged to, these, to control these resources. And that has increased poverty levels among the women who live in the Balose floodplains. So the men, the Indunas, have taken, you know, their they have taken control. So when it comes to when it comes to access and benefiting, the women are not benefiting. That's why you find that mostly in the Balose Fried Plains, the fishermen, the fishers are men other than the women. So the women become the fishmongers instead. After this conversation, I was very curious to understand what's it like to be a female fishmonger. I met Precious, a single mother of five, at the Kashumba fish market and asked if I could join her into the floodplain to buy fish. She agreed and a few days later we took a taxi towards the little Zambezi. There we got into a dugout that took us to the village of her cousin. After two wobbly hours in the dugout, we arrived safely in the village. Oh, okay, here, here where we are. 
This is in the village called Sinyamba. It's our village. We come here to come and buy fish. And tomorrow, after buying fish, then we are going back to Mungu. Yeah. Yeah. The next morning, the fishers leave to empty their nets. Precious awaits them so that she can buy their fish. How much are you going to sell it for? The investments are written down in a personal administration. Eventually, she spends all the money that she owns on the fish. Now, it's key to go to the market as fast as possible. Finally, we arrive in the bustling fish market. Precious quickly starts selling as it needs to be sold today. At one point, I get a bit nervous as business is slow and there's a lot of competition. However, slowly but steady, she sells all her fish in six hours. I'm very happy to finish my business. I'm very, very happy to finish my business. Spending time with Precious gave me a good insight in her world. Fortunately, Precious knows people in the floodplain. For other women, it's even more difficult to buy fish. In the fishing camps, there's what we call um, uh, sex for fish. Yeah, so the women will come with that concept, sex for fish. You know, so they will give sex to the fishermen, then the fishermen in exchange will give them, will give them fish. Yeah, so this is what goes around. I'm quite shocked with what David tells me and want to investigate this story. So I go to the fish market where I meet a group of fishmongers that are willing to do an interview with me. As the interview progresses, I ask them if they ever heard of sex for fish. After the interview, we decide to take a picture together. Hopefully, the practice of sex or fish can be stopped in the future. As I'm sure, this negatively influences the fishery. It was interesting to learn about why the lousy people fish and trade in fish. It is mostly about earning a livelihood and feeding themselves and their family. 
We will see later that this is key in understanding how the Lozi people look at the issues in the fishery. To further understand how the Lozi people look at the world, we need to dive into the history of governance of Barotseland. I'm having a meeting with Nduna Mubonda, who is the Minister of Fisheries in the traditional leadership. He tells me about their governance structure. Mona Pukenam Napuso Malapa Fudo Malapa Puso, Yakumuma village, Munga Munzi Kudakumunga Munzi, Yavasila Landa Kudavasila Landa, Yavasilalo Silalo, Skirit, Skiriti Province Kaona Mukwa. This governance structure allows the influence of the traditional leadership to be distributed throughout the floodplain and it was used to manage the fishery in the old days. This changed when Barotseland joined Zambia to form one country to the Barotseland Agreement 1964. The agreement was entered into with the rest of the country by way of protecting the fundamental and the privileges of the who should be or who is the Tunga for the king of Barosland, his council and all the people to enjoy their rights and the fundamentals and the principles on their natural resources. Unfortunately, the agreement could not last long. It was abrogated. So like the Barros people were hipped with the other people, they, they don't collaborate with the, with the culture, the tradition. It was just a mixture, like you mix sugar, and salt in a cup. The tastes are different. That's where the problems arose. Throughout time, the Lozi people demonstrated against the Barotseland Agreement. Because we have been neglected for 46 years. There is nothing which is happening. We are tired. Like in 2011, when 19 people were killed by the Zambian government during a demonstration against the Barotseland Agreement. The Barotseland Agreement and the killings created distrust towards the Zambian government. Trust is a key indicator for social learning and it appears that the trust between the Zambian government and the Lozi people is damaged. <laughs> After the abrogation of the Barotseland Agreement, Barotseland, now Western Province, opened up for the rest of Zambia. The people from outside of Barotseland brought other fishing methods than the Lozis were used to, like the use of mosquito nets to fish. They open the nets against the current and leave it for a minute. Then they pull the net towards the bank to empty it. When the net is empty, the women and children rush to the front when no one has fished yet. Another new method that came in was the Sefa Sefa, which is a long drag net made out of mosquito nets, sometimes 200 meters long, which they drag through a stream. 
A fisher from the royal village of Le Louis gives me his opinion about fishing with mosquito nets and sefa sefa. Yeah, I was uh, I was talking of uh, the things like uh, the sefa sefas. Mm -hmm. Those are the bad method of fishing because what do they do? They even catch uh, little fish which are supposed to grow. They even get the, the eggs which are supposed to hatch. So, in that way, we are destroying the, the fish. The Lozi people saw how much fish was caught when using the sefa sefa and mosquito nets and started copying these new methods to make more money. This situation can be seen as an example of social learning in the fishery but in the context of making more money for the people in the short term or as an adaptation to a changing fishery. It also shows that social learning does not necessarily lead to sustainability. Joining Zambia also had the effect that Barotseland became a transit route. Because of this, many people from foreign places started to buy fish for export, which raised the fish prices and increased demand. This further incentivized fishers to fish even harder, as there's always someone to sell the fish to, which again increased fishing pressure. I make my way over to Mulamba Harbor to see what is happening in terms of export. There is the export of fresh fish and the export of dried fish. The fresh fish is going to Kaoma. The dried fish is going to Lusaka and the Congo. In my time in the Barotsa floodplain, it struck me that most families are quite large. Over time, the population of the western province increased from 400,000 in 1975 to more than 1 million people in 2015. This also feeds into an increased pressure on the fishery as fishing is the main livelihood of the Lozi people. It is clear now that the Barotsa floodplain fishery changed a lot since Barotsa land became the western province of Zambia. Due to new efficient ways of catching fish, an increase in the number of fishers and human population and a higher demand from foreign places, the fish stocks were experienced to decline and people started to increase their fishing efforts even more as they needed to continue to sustain themselves. This started a downward cycle driven by poverty 
where people are continuously increasing fishing pressure to survive. will venture into the current governance of the fishery and how the different stakeholders look at the efforts of the Zambian government to manage the fishery sustainable. The Department of Fisheries or DOF implemented a number of fisheries regulations through the Fishery Act 2011. Brighto Malambo, the acting principal fisheries officer of the Western Province, tells me about these regulations. Okay, because as the Republic of Zambia, through the Ministry of Fisheries and Livestock and the Department of Fisheries, there are the fisheries regulations which are there. They say fishers should not use those. the weirs should not use um, uh, gill nets, which are below three inches. Okay, should not use drag nets. Okay, all oh, oh, mesh sizes for monofilament nets are not allowed. Okay. This means that almost all the fishing methods we saw before are considered illegal. I'm meeting with Dr. Machai Chomba, the Upper Zambezi landscape manager of WWF Zambia. He gives me his thoughts on the current fisheries regulations. Well, I think the, the system, as you know, is a, is a multi-resource, but also a multi-fish uh, uh, fishery, which has got so many um, um, uh, fisheries in, in it. Uh, however, I think the regulations don't always reflect the, the dynamic nature of the system. What Machaya is saying makes a lot of sense to me. The Barotsa floodplain fishery is unique. And it seems difficult to manage all the fisheries in Zambia with a one-size-fits-all approach. I'm also very curious to find out why all the fishers, according to the law, are using illegal fishing methods. Yeah, since it's the government which has uh, authorized that, we, we, we may adhere, but the problem is, you won't get as you expected. If you use a bigger mesh, you get less. You yourself, you can adhere to the regulation from the government, but others, they are, they are using this, yet you are staying in the same locality. Where are you? I'm also surprised that all monofilament nets under three inches are prohibited, as they are sold everywhere. I'm meeting with Sikapa Andrew, a fishnet trader, who tells me about the sale of nets with small mesh sizes. Uh, these are quite small in size. Since the very small, small fishes are going to grow, the fishermen need them like at this time of the year. They prohibit them. Them, they do not uh, regard that uh, some fishes do not grow. Yeah. What Sikapa is saying is an example that the one-size-fits-all approach of the Fishery Act 2011 may not fit the Barotsa floodplain fishery. Still, I noticed that there is a call present amongst the people in the floodplain to ban nets with small meshes. As I submerge myself deep into the heart of the traditional leadership, I achieved this by building friendships with my landlord, Frederick Malopo, and his best friend, Manamafa Akafuna, who is part of the royal family of Barotsaland. They want to help me with my research and bring me in contact with Chief Nalebutu, the brother of the Litunga. Manamafa tells me to write an official letter to the chief, which was received very well. <laughs> and he organized a three-day program in the royal village of Leelui and Liala. During my visit, 
the chief gives his opinion on the use of nets with small meshes while we take a dip in the floodplain. We should ban this. We have to convince the people here not to use this size of nets. We have to convince people not to use this size of nets. Unless we stop this size, there will be no fish in Barossa land. Next to the gear regulations, the Zambian government implemented a yearly fishing ban from the 1st of December until the 1st of March. I'm curious to find out what the Lozi people think of this measure. We go to Liala. There, I meet the village headman in his house and the Silelanda, Simenda Sililo, who is the area chief. The village was called together for a meeting. And the purpose of my visit was translated to the rest of the village. After the introduction, Simenda tells me what he thinks about the fishing ban. What Simenda tells me shows that the Lozi people are not against the fish ban but they still continue to fish as they have no other way of sustaining themselves. Still, I'm surprised that there are no apparent repercussions from the Zambian government for breaking the law. Mr. Malambo tells me what the DOF does in terms of enforcement of their regulations. Okay, there is what we call uh, fishery surveillance, monitoring and control. We check on the waters, what are the people using, what type of gear are they using, so that we can control these illegal fishing methods and gear. So also during the, the fishing ban, we enforce the fishing ban. No one is allowed to catch fish or trade in fish during that, that period. And if somebody is found with that, that, that is an offense. A person can be imprisoned. Okay? The Lozi people appear to not like it when the DOF are enforcing the fisheries regulations as it inhibits them from earning a livelihood which feeds into the distrust towards the Zambian government. I meet up with Paul Zulu, a fisheries officer in Senanga who tells me about the challenges when it comes to enforcing the regulations. It's really, it's really like a war. A war. You, you, you can't go alone just as fishers officers without being accompanied by security. Then it means you can be, even be killed. They can, they will come with these spears, but when they will see that at least there's a, a police officer or Zawa, at least they will run away. It appears to be difficult and dangerous for the DOF to enforce their regulations. In Dune Mubonda also has a clear opinion about the enforcement of the DOF. Uh, I'm wondering how the traditional leadership is assisting in the enforcement. As before joining Zambia, they were enforcing their own regulations through their own court system. Say what I say. 
It seems that the traditional leadership no longer has the authority to enforce the fisheries regulations. Also, it is the question if they want to enforce the regulations as I sit down with Chief Nalabutu. And we don't want to be misunderstood, misconstrued that we are, we are stopping people from uh, making their own livelihood. But I, like I've said, we, we, we are for the idea of a fish ban. Very useful. It makes sense that the chief does not want his people to suffer by not allowing them to fish. Nevertheless, I ask him what he can do so that his people adhere to the fisheries regulations. Convince, talk, just have, talk to them and uh, beg them. I don't know what else can I do. Beg them and let them see the reason why we should not break the rules. They should, because it's for their benefit. That's the only source we have. It strikes me that he says he can only beg his people, which is a sign for me that the traditional leadership is weakened. However, they still have influence as they can regulate who fishes in their area. This complicates the regulation of the fishery for the Zambian government. Because according to the Fisheries Act, a fisher should be paid fishing license yearly, every year. So now they have continued their pay to traditional leadership. So when it comes to like fisheries regulatory fees, you say pay for fishing license becomes a challenge there. Because some will say we already paid. I asked Semenda what his perspective is regarding this issue. We think like can do na yo maka bonela ha sifaka sa hai. Kuna ni kuli nduna wa kona ko hana ka pakulumela. Kono ntu eru kataza kona bo bota na bo bulsweli. Kuli luna ba ba zimo buloze always we in power ka hana ni kalilo ko makalelo. Kona kuli ba ba tu ba ba tabana ni mali luna ha luna mashiring. The low mandate and the limited resources of the DOF to enforce the regulations the damaged trust of the lousy people towards the Zambian government and the perceived weakened traditional leadership appear to have resulted in a free access fishery where illegal fishing methods are the standard and there is little regulation on the number of fishers. This may have contributed to the experienced decline in fish stocks. Unfortunately, it is the local communities that struggle because of these governance issues as they are stuck in their current ways of fishing and trading. As of now, it appears that the traditional leadership and the DOF reached a point where they recognized their own weaknesses in the governance structure of the fishery, which may have led to the realization and a change in views that they need each other to ensure a future for the Barotsa floodplain fishery.
Il est tapis, il est capable de faire. Comme il y a un peu de temps, il y a un peu de temps, Yes, yes, yes. So, so that some people they don't want to adhere to the law, and the, uh, because the department of fisheries is not always there, we can be talking here. We have a program. Somebody is fishing there and doing their own things. So that's why the department is really pushing for uh, co-management. Having this common interest could work as a breeding ground for social learning. NGOs like WWF, YWCA, KZF and Action Aid have come in to support the governance of the fishery in terms of knowledge and additional resources. Sibeso Munika Kumbwa, the program officer of the Kipe Zambia Foundation, or KZF, tells me why the commitment of these NGOs act as a catalyst in the process towards co-management. I think we have an advantage because we are privileged to speak to all parties. Huh? We can engage with all these parties. We are able to and also bring them together. Yeah, so I'd say so. And we are also privileged to interact directly with the community and get the views of the community, what the people, the actual beneficiaries want. The NGOs started experimenting with co-management to village management committees. I visited a few of these management committees to hear about what they do and why they do it. And Kakuba Bagatengo, Karukanda Management Service Committee, Luz Yanga Maten, my community, Kopanani, my community, Baruna, Bambota, Mukwa, Quitu Cesa, Fumuana, one Baltap is a Manuka. Sibeso explains to me why the management committees appear to be an effective tool for the governance of the fishery. So when we talk of co-management, we are looking at the community, because the, the government, the Zambezi is quite long. The government cannot employ officers eh, to be at every point. Eh? So the form, formation of these groups has really helped. It's, it's an advantage to them as a community, because they will be able to manage their own resources. And it, it also gives them that sense of ownership. Like, okay, this is ours. So the owners to protect, to manage, to take care of, it's on us. The village management committees will eventually fall under the authority of an overarching management committee that will be formed through the co-management process. Dr. Machai Chomba explains to me what he sees as the largest challenges in setting up an effective co-management process. Is that uh, the history of the area also has resulted in certain tensions but also um, uh, mistrust between the actors, the traditional leaders and, and government. We need to um, establish good relationships among the actors. So a key component is bring them together. Let them say out the issues. Let them then start from the place now we can say, okay, we are now, uh, can we able, then be able to talk? Uh, I, I think, and, and I think that is, that, uh, yeah, that is key. Creating collaborative social relationships among the different actors. Yeah. Co-management shows potential to solve the governance issues 
in the fishery. However, it will not reduce the dependency of the local communities on the fishery. To reduce this dependency, the Zambian government is promoting alternate livelihoods like aquaculture by bringing it closer to the Lozi people. The DOF does this in cooperation with KZF. They've set up aquaculture ponds with different communities along the floodplain. So we have stocked uh, how many in Western Province? Two, two districts, that's Senanga and Nalolo. We have stocked nine ponds. So they are expected um, in should be somewhere around 40,000, 50,000. And doing a pond, just need around, like a second one, like this one. You only need probably 20,000 is enough. It appears that there is good money to be made in having an aquaculture pond. However, there are only nine communities that are lucky enough to have guidance and help with the initial investment. Fortunately, there are other ways that communities can be supported to get the funds. If you don't have um, a capital, you can always apply um, through CDF. Because CDF has a lot of funds for community projects and also there is funding through CEC. People can still get loans to do the fish ponds. Although there are these funds, few people in the floodplain make use of it or know of its existence. This is no different in Liala. <laughs> Okay, what I was trying to say that uh, since here uh, we need empowerment, since you are working with the WWF collaborating, so at least you link it with us to any NGO so that it can give us some resources because we are lacking the resources. Yes, so that uh, we can do the same. We are having putting some fish, fish, fishes in the what in the, in the ponds. Yeah, that way we can sustain. Switching to alternate livelihoods might be a small step in the right direction to reduce fishing pressure. However, for having an impact, more communities need to be empowered by informing them about the options there are in terms of getting funds and having guidance in the process of switching to alternate livelihoods. Almost all stakeholders perceive switching to alternate livelihoods and co-management as viable options on the path towards a more sustainable Barotsa floodplain fishery. This common ground could be an important starting point for social learning to learn to manage the fishery together. However, switching to alternate livelihoods and implementing a co-management process requires additional resources. Therefore, I call upon anyone who sees this documentary to contact me for investments in the path towards a more sustainable Barotsa floodplain fishery. Throughout my time in the Barotsa floodplain, it became clear to me that there are no quick fixes towards a more sustainable fishery. The will of the local communities to change is there. But they are stuck in their ways of fishing and trading to earn a livelihood. The history of governance between the traditional leadership and the Zambian government add to the complicated nature of the fishery. It appears to negatively influence social learning towards a more sustainable fishery. As it is experienced that the fish stocks are still declining. The positive side is that the experienced decline in fish stocks may have resulted in a change in how the stakeholders look at their world which appears to have led to an increase in common ground between them to work together. This increase in common ground 
and commitment of most stakeholders to the upcoming co-management process might have a positive effect on social learning. Personally, I've become emotionally invested by building relationships with the people I've met on this journey. I therefore also want to see a more sustainable fishery as it might improve the lives of these people. In my personal opinion, co-management offers a good chance for moving forward on the path towards a more sustainable Barotsa floodplain fishery and gives me hope for the future. But it's the choice of the stakeholders if they take this chance or not. <laughs>